With us on our panel, Anti-Semitism Around the World, a Global Alert, is Eli Kohanim, Deputy Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism at the U.S. State Department, and Katarina von Schnurbein, the European Commission Coordinator on Combating Anti-Semitism. And we invite you, our audience, to use the Q&A function of Zoom to submit questions, which we'll review as time allows at the end of the conversation. Ellie, Katerina, welcome to you both. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, Dan. It's wonderful being with you. Nice to have you both with us today. Katerina, we'll begin with you. Uh, there's been an uptick in COVID-19 cases throughout Europe, with many countries being placed back on complete lockdown once again, Spain, France, Germany, perhaps others. We're in touch with our leadership across Europe, and there's no doubt that the pandemic is placing a huge strain on Jewish communities. Of course, this has to do with the enormous health and economic challenges, but also with a tremendous disruption to Jewish religious practice and worryingly, an explosion of anti-Semitic conspiracies, particularly online. Uh, can you speak to how the pandemic has affected Europe's Jewish community in your perspective and how has your work uh, adapted to these circumstances? Thank you, Dan. Yeah, it's uh, really wonderful to be with uh, Nybrit again. Um, almost a regular exchange by now, <laughs> already, already the second online conversation we're having um, and indeed what you what you uh, address is really worrying and uh, and unfortunately we have seen uh, not only an upswing of uh, anti-semitic rhetoric uh, on the net but also uh, combinations between different groups of people um, in the real world in demonstrations on the streets where anti vaxxers um, correlate with anti um, anti semites and from the left to the right um, we see how this is pushing also into mainstream uh, society so this trend is indeed very worrying and we have we have different ways of uh, addressing it one is in more in general the way we have been in Europe addressing hate speech online, that is illegal hate speech and speech inciting to hatred and violence, where we have a, a code of conduct that requests and um, um, where basically the platforms have committed to take down illegal hate speech. But this um, we feel is no longer enough. What we need now is really rules for them to be more transparent, to be clearer, and to ensure that takedown really happens uh, in a much quicker rate. So we will be presenting legislation on the Digital Service Act. And in fact, my brief together with other Jewish organizations has submitted suggestions for how this legislation could look like with regards also to hate speech. Um, and um, the Commission will present that kind of legislation before the end of the year. Um, on top, we also think that there is a responsibility on the side of the platforms. We welcome the fact that uh, Facebook has committed to taking down uh, Holocaust denial and distortion. However, in Europe, this has been illegal all along. So in fact, in Europe, they are just coming inside the law with their decision and it was about uh, time. And then we think that there is a need also to strengthen the action of the users. Um, we started a campaign which is called Think Before Sharing together with UNESCO on Twitter where we help debunk conspiracy myths because we think that the fact that around COVID, we have seen this upswing, not only of outright hate speech, but also of conspiracy myths that are not necessarily illegal, but we have seen in the terrorist attacks like in Halle, um, the synagogue attack in Halle last year, that the road from conspiracy myths to uh, hate crime, uh, on the street is very short. And therefore we think that we need to uh, monitor in a much closer way also conspiracy myths and help users debunk um, conspiracy myths. So this is, let's say, on the in a large uh, scheme. Then we also see, of course, that um, anti-Semitic 
content comes in from outside. We created a foreign interference uh, strategic communication unit in the Foreign Action Service to ensure that this kind of um, uh, content is uh, removed in much quicker way and counteracted as well, for example. Was the COVID-19 issue just uh, conjured up for us in our community uh, where all of these uh, anti-Semitic uh, statements were being made on the internet and beyond just uh, reminds us of the, the blood libels that go back to, to the Middle Ages. And uh, the, the difference is, is that today, uh, these blood libels can simply be trumpeted uh, on platforms to millions and millions of, of yeah. people. So it, it becomes even more dangerous uh, than, than perhaps it, it was then. Uh, Ellie, uh, your uh, portfolio includes monitoring the situation in Latin America, North Africa, and the Middle East. So um, I have a, a two-part question here. One is, what are you seeing in what you're following on COVID-19 in, in those areas? And, and also, um, the, the question of uh, the First Amendment uh, how we deal with hate online is it, our perspective is different than it is in Europe and, and in other places regarding legislation, what can be done uh, um, independently, privately, uh, by urging, uh, and what can be legislated. Uh, what are your observations on that? Dan, those are two uh, fantastic questions. Um, before I, I address your questions, I just want to take a moment and really um, commend the B'nai B'rith leadership on all that B'nai B'rith does. I really want to um, thank you and your president, Chuck Kaufman, for inviting me here today. And also want to uh, acknowledge my co-panelist, C- Commissioner Von Schnorbein. It's wonderful to uh, share this panel with you. Um, so Chuck, to your questions regarding uh, uh, I'm sorry, Dan, to your questions regarding um, regarding COVID-19 and specifically the regions of the world that I'm responsible for in our office, which is uh, the Special Envoy's Office to Monitor and Combat Anti-Semitism at the U.S. State Department. Um, regarding COVID, uh, we've seen a tremendous uptick of um, conspiracy theories, either uh, a- accusing Jews or the state of Israel of somehow creating this virus, even though we all know it emanated from China, or that Jews or the state of Israel would somehow profit from this virus or from vaccines. Um, regarding the regions that I am in charge of, what was shocking to us, I think, was to see that not only were these conspiracy theories coming out from the usual bad actors, but we actually saw government officials in places like Turkey, the Palestinian Authority, and the regime in Iran also uh, spreading these lies against Jews and the Jewish state of Israel. And um, so, Dan, I would tell you that that is, uh, you know, behavior that this administration does not tolerate, you know, government officials actually spreading lies and conspiracy theories. The uh, question regarding uh, the internet, which I think is very linked to the, the COVID conspiracy theories, is that the internet sadly has become Um, a medium which allows, like you just said, millions and millions of people to be on the receiving end of these lies um, in a way that, you know, in prior eras, this this just didn't exist. And so you have uh, misinformation and lies getting getting out to people in in high speed. Um, And so I think maybe your audience might know that our office actually just hosted the first ever U.S. government conference on combating internet and social media anti-Semitism. And um, to your point, Dan, the U.S. uh, certainly does have different approach to free speech than what you would find in the European Union. So that uh, free speech is um, a value that Americans treasure from, you know, from the beginning of our history. And so it does become more complicated for us. I would tell you that all of the social media companies have their own um, rules of conduct. And so we know that when there's incitement to hatred, when there's targeting of Jews, those go against the social media companies' all own rules and regulations. And so it's very simple enough to ask that the social media companies just uphold their own regulations. And at that point, we're not actually um, advocating for any limitations on the free speech of American citizens. You know, what's frankly uh, about the social media companies and the debate 
it's unfortunate that we even had a debate about Holocaust denial, mm. whether or not it goes up or it doesn't, whether it's misinformation or not. So we have to deal with that. We have to deal with the social media companies. But beyond that, I mean, we are now heading into uh, territory where um, one day, um, and it's going to be uh, perhaps in our lifetimes, um, at least uh, certainly in yours and in many others, uh, there will be no more Holocaust survivors to say that they saw it, no more to say that they experienced this barbarity. And if we're having this discussion now about Holocaust denial going up on, on the internet, uh, we can only think uh, 10 years down the line, 15 years down the line, what that's going to mean when there are no people there to say, I actually was there, I actually saw it. So this, this battle that we're having now is extremely important, not only because of the moment, but also because of, of the future. I, I wanna move into um, the area of Jewish security, uh, questions to you both. Uh, Katerina, one of the things that you've been consistently uh, preoccupied with in your role uh, has been the very fundamental issue of security. Uh, we cannot speak of Jewish life in Europe without guaranteeing this rudimentary element of physical safety. Yet events like the attacks at synagogues in, in Germany or kosher restaurants in France or cemeteries in Greece show us that physical safety itself is not a given. How are you thinking about this topic and what can the European Commission do and what is the responsibility of EU countries, governments uh, to deal with this very important issue? Yes, Dan, I think you're uh, hitting the nail on the head. And we know also from our surveys that security is the number one concern of the Jewish communities, which is only natural because if you are not safe, you don't feel safe in your daily uh, lives, then everything else uh, is, uh, can be put into question and eventually even uh, your future or the future of your children uh, in Europe. So we are acutely aware of uh, of this uh, challenge. And um, in fact, the unanimous adoption of the declaration um, on antisemitism by all EU member states in 2018 focused or started um, from uh, the issue of security. We think that member states are responsible to secure all their citizens, no matter what it takes. And it is not for the communities to pay for uh, their security. Because what we see often at the moment is that a lot of uh, funds from uh, Jewish communities actually have to go into security measures. And this is not how it should be. Um, we, we have therefore created a working group um, between member states and representatives from the Jewish community of that member state. And we gather in Brussels uh, twice a year to look also into the uh, issues of security and ensure that this conversation takes place between the Jewish communities and the relevant uh, state authorities um, to, in, to look into how the situation is specifically uh, in that context. And we are pushing member states also from the political level, from uh, Vice President Skinner's level, but also President uh, von der Leyen to ensure that also the, the political level engages fully with um, uh, the Jewish communities uh, to make, for example, joint risk assessments, um, train also um, police staff. This is something that we saw was very problematic in the uh, attack on the synagogue in, uh, in Germany because the police simply wasn't aware what Yom Kippur was and what it meant if a, a mobile phone goes on, on Yom Kippur and says, we, ha we are having a, um, an incident outside. So, um, all of this, um, I believe, is, is important. The training of law enforcement, the training also of judges um, to ensure that in the long term we have, um, uh, we ensure the security. And, and we are, of course, aware that the Jewish community, while they say we need it, are not are not happy that it is needed and we are not none of us are and i think um while it is necessary we have to do everything together with the um member states and we have ourselves also on european level um created now what is called a call for proposal for um uh, jewish communities and other uh, faith communities 
together with um, other groups or with their member state um, to uh, submit concepts, security concepts that then can be funded also by uh, the European Commission directly, while in general security policy to a large extent, especially uh, when it comes to police forces is in the hands of the member states. So we have to balance this, but in the global uh, sphere also when it comes to counter-terrorism measures, for example, this is very much led by the European Union. Thank you. Ellie, uh, in the US after the attack on the Tree of Life congregation in Pittsburgh just a few weeks ago, uh, the question of having guards and metal detectors emerged and it was shocking uh, to many. Uh, my synagogue uh, has a, a police car uh, out in front uh, when, uh, when we have services. Um, and there are so many other congregations and institutions, of course, that, that have that here. How do we, in, in your perspective, uh, keep a balance between protecting the Jewish community, but also making sure that it can live openly and, and proudly uh, and, uh, and visibly? Dan, you know, I would tell you, um, uh, like you said, it was it was uh, the anniversary of the uh, attack on the Pittsburgh synagogue, and and soon after that, we saw the attack on the Poway synagogue in San Diego. Um, I would tell you that I think for the Jews in America, those attacks were kind of the loss of innocence for us, right? So that from, from really the beginning of the Jewish presence in the United States, there has been a warm embrace of the Jewish people. Well, there have been some, you know, low points in that history. At the same time, America has been the most philo-Semitic country in, in world history. So um, those two synagogue attacks, I think, were the loss of innocence for American Jews. I think it was the first time that America and Jews kind of turned, we turned to ourselves and said, oh my God, you know, is this over? Is it time for us to pack up our bags and leave like we've had to do every other country in the world throughout our history? And Dan, what I would posit is that um, even though uh, the, you know, the Pittsburgh attack was the deadliest attack on American Jews in our history, it is not true that uh, that we are in a state of uh, of having to to flee this country. Um, America, I think, continues to be the most philo-Semitic country in the world. Uh, we have a president that has been the most supportive of the Jewish people in the state of Israel, and so um, in terms of being openly Jewish, I think that you still see all over the country that American Jews are openly Jewish. We are still worshiping in public. We are, you know, there are. Jews walking around with yarmulkes. Um, at the same time, um, I don't think any of us can ignore the rise of anti-Semitism here at home. So that visibly Jewish Jews in places like New York are sadly being attacked uh, and targeted uh, all over New York. And, um, <clears throat> and that's something that I actually recently wrote about in a Newsweek opinion piece about how we cannot ignore the anti-Semitism uh, that we're witnessing in the United States, whether it's coming from the far right uh, white supremacist camp or the far left, um, far left camp, which uh, often um, comes from minority populations, which is what we're seeing in New York right now, or from radical Islamic sources. Um, and so, Dan, I would say that uh, American Jews are still, you know, in a country that that still um, offers them security and protection. But yes, we do have to be more careful than we've ever been in our time here. Thank you. The um, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, known by its acronym IRA, is a uh, consortium of uh, countries that are committed to uh, advancing Holocaust education and Holocaust uh, remembrance uh, programs. The IRA working definition of anti-Semitism is at this point uh, the clear standard uh, for understanding manifestations of anti-Semitism. Uh, yet many countries, uh, including uh, some in the EU, uh, and there are other countries around the world, and, and we'd like to, I'd like to ask this of both of you, um, have yet to formally adopt it. Uh, why is that? And in the places where the definition has been adopted, uh, how have you seen that being operationalized? Has, how has the definition helped actually in practice? So Katerina, uh, first to you. Yes, uh, the definition has 
definitely become the benchmark. And I think in two directions. One is to recognize all contemporary forms of anti-Semitism and the different sources uh, it comes from. And Ellie already mentioned um, uh, right-wing extremism, left-wing extremism, Islamists, but also from uh, within the middle of society. And um, uh, the Israel-related anti-Semitism just as much as the old racist uh, anti-Semitism, conspiracy myths, and uh, all these different uh, forms and how they play out uh, today. So this is indeed uh, the, the central aspect of having this um, non-legally binding working definition. On the other side, as you already hinted, it's also a sign that, that um, governments are ready to address anti-Semitism in all its forms. And so Within that uh, declaration that I already mentioned um, from 2018, member states committed to adopting, not only adopting the IRA definition, but also using it. Um, and so what we have seen is that now 18 um, out of the 20, 27 EU member states have formally adopted it. Some use it without formally adopting it, but um, we see that still when it comes to the concrete use, for example, in training for law enforcement, in training for teachers, um, we have recently uh, signed a letter also together with Ilan Carr uh, that was initiated by uh, the British uh, Special Envoy on uh, addressing anti-Semitism um, for uh, addressing uh, for, for sports organization and football organizations to use the IRA definition. So we think this is a, a instrument that can be used widely in uh, society. It can be used, for example, also by the media. Um, and uh, what is important is that um, the state authorities, but also general public becomes aware of this definition because for now it's very much in expert circles. And so we are um, issuing together with the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance in December, guidance to the practical use of the IRA definition where we use the examples to show what kind of incidents have happened that can be identified um, across Europe basically uh, on the basis of the IRA definition and how um, member states of the EU have started to use it. And we hope that this uh, guidance will help member states um, to become more concrete in how you can use it and maybe even beyond uh, uh, the EU. We will now have in a few days a discussion with the UN, you know, so maybe this, this can be a useful tool also uh, to others. And I think it is really important uh, to, uh, to su support uh, the initiatives on national level and in, as part of this declaration, member states have also agreed to having national strategies on anti-Semitism and in an attempt to make those as concrete and as operational as, as possible, um, we think that um, this guidance uh, can be helpful. And then also for our own EU strategy that we will uh, issue in 2021. Thanks. Uh, Ellie, in the areas of the globe that you cover, you know, we think sometimes of the IRA definition as, as something which should be Europe centric or Europe specific, but that's that's not really the case. We want everyone to to adopt this. And so in those areas uh, that you are working in, uh, what are you seeing? Dan, you know, I think, first of all, um, just to have kind of a philosophical understanding of the uh, importance of the, the IRA definition. Um, if you understand that anti-Semitism is something that, like a virus, kind of mutates over time and over societies, so that today in a post-Holocaust era, the anti-Semitism that we're often dealing with, which is not as accepted, in, you know, what's what's ex not accepted in polite society any longer is classical Jew hatred, right? But the new form of anti-Semitism that we're seeing is, is the hatred and singling out of the Jewish state of Israel. And so why the IRA definition is so valuable is that it's, it's first of all, it helps us define the problem. What is anti-Semitism? Then the, uh, the IRA definition has the working, um, it has the uh, examples underneath it. And it's something actually that I keep on my desk all the time. And so underneath the IRA, for example, it says that any criticism, legitimate criticism of the state of Israel is fine, right? 
However, when you compare Israel's policy to the Nazis and Nazi policy, then you've crossed the line into anti-Semitism. So, um, so Dan, I think it's first of all, just really important for people to understand how important this definition is in helping people, societies, governments, know when speech or when action has crossed the line into anti-Semitism. Um, now, regarding areas outside of Europe where the IRA has been adopted and, and, uh, and we obviously advocate for the IRA adoption everywhere in the world, I would tell you, Dan, that in our office, we recently signed a memorandum of understanding with Bahrain's King Hamad Center for uh, Peaceful Coexistence. And within that MOU, we reference the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. So now you're talking about the Arab world for the first time using the IRA definition to define anti-Semitism in its work. And um, I think that's a huge milestone um, as we're seeing warming of ties between the Arab, Arab Gulf countries and the state of Israel and Jewish communities around the world. Um, I think that the, we will see more and more the adoption of the IRA definition. I also mm -hmm. want to share with you uh, another recent, uh, I think, huge victory that we've had with the Muslim world is um, a body called the Global Imams Council, um, which also just recently adopted the IRA definition. Uh, it was a unanimous vote. And I would tell you that the Global Imams Council adoption of the IRA is such a courageous and bold move on their part because most of their membership are Shia Muslims. So that this is not a group where these Imams are tied to a government that is uh, ha you know, supporting this effort or has their back in this or that it was it wasn't like a top-down decision these are imams a thousand over a thousand imams around the world who've adopted the ira definition and they don't necessarily have any government support they don't necessarily have anybody behind them and so we're so so proud to have partnered with them in making this decision and encouraging them to do this and um, i have to tell you dan i think that this is actually revolutionary stuff happening in the middle east well, we're talking about um, this, this kind of common denominator definition, which is extremely important, really important. And um, what the imams have done and what others are doing outside um, specific governments uh, is, as you say, extremely important. But I want to move into kind of a corollary here. Uh, and let's talk about Holocaust education, the importance of Holocaust education in combating anti-Semitism. And um, Ellie, we'll start with you on this one, uh, and also an initiative uh, that the Special Envoy's Office uh, has launched regarding philo anti-Semitism uh, in terms of, of educating. So tell us about that. Okay, Dan. Um so I'll start. I'll start in the order. I, I will first uh, share more about our efforts in uh, in promoting philo-Semitism because Dan, you know, when you're combating anti-Semitism, and I'm sure Commissioner Schnorbein will uh, comment on this as well. Um, you find that it's 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 always it's kind of a fight against the darkness, and so um, it's also I think very important to shine the light where we can, and um, and I think that what we've understood in our office is that not only do you combat anti-Semitism by 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 advocating for the adoption of the IRA and advocating for security costs and advocating for strong hate crimes legislation and enforcement of hate crimes legislation. But it's also important for world societies to understand um, who the Jewish people are, what is the history of Jews in their countries. And truly, if you look at every country and every society throughout time where there has been a Jewish population, you, you just find that there has been so much contribution by Jews to their communities, to their societies. And so our office um, has been working with Jewish uh, organizations nationally and internationally, and I hope that this is something that the B'nai B'rith will take on also, to really celebrate the Jewish contribution to the United States, but really to every country where there are Jews. And in the United States specifically, we have something called Jewish American Heritage Month, which is the month of May. Now, um, Dan, when I speak to audiences across the country, no one seems to really know anything about it. Um, whereas there are other heritage months celebrated in the United States that everybody knows about. So um, it's, it's really a challenge that I bring to B'nai B'rith and I bring to Jewish leaders around the world 
let you know celebrate Jewish contributions and let us um, therefore you know help the spread of philo-Semitism and really the the friendship and respect towards Jews that I think is possible for us to see everywhere. Uh, well, when you talk about um, philo-Semitism and, and a special um, some kind of concentration on Jewish contributions, let's say, to, to the United States. I mean, I remember, you know, even as an eighth grader, uh, when we would talk about immigrants who came to the United States, and they would talk about uh, famous uh, German immigrants, so they would say Albert Einstein, or they would say famous Hungarian immigrants, and they would say Joseph Pulitzer, but they never really added the Jewish part to it. And uh, we always felt it left out in a way. So the importance of uh, of focusing on Jewish contributions to the, the great history of this country is, is extremely important. And, and really, we commend you uh, for that. Um, Katarina, Holocaust education, the importance of it in, in battling anti Semitism, what would you say? So I believe that uh, we have to, um, as uh, Eli already also mentioned, uh, look at both. Um, Understanding how it could possibly come to the Holocaust is crucial, and uh, it will continue um, to to be necessary to ensure that uh, every generation will understand how, in a in a civilized country, it could come uh, to this. And it's as mind blowing as it is, I think we have to uh, support and continue to support, uh, for example, research on this. We have um, on European level, a European Holocaust research infrastructure where we um, connect uh, and we, we basically we finance it, but they are independent and they connect uh, different memorial sites, research centers, and also the US Holocaust Memorial and Yad Vashem um, to ensure that independent research um, is possible and um, that the digitalization of the archives continues. So for example, in countries where we see that national narratives are challenging um, the, uh, the understanding of the Holocaust, because it's you know, uh, very clear, for example, that in Poland, um, Poles were also victims, but they were possibly also collaborators. So this narrative needs to um, continue. And, uh, and I believe that it is very important to understand um, the, 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 the Holocaust in its specific dimension in industrial killing of Jews and targeting of, uh, of Jews. Um, and so it was anti-Semitism that led to the Holocaust. And it's also therefore very important that we understand the science today and we will understand them better if we understand the history leading um, to the Holocaust. But I think that we have in comparison to other aspects focused at least in Europe rather more on the Holocaust. And therefore we have an image of Jews only being victims. And uh, we have, we have a, a situation where it is necessary to really focus also on the Jewish contribution and on Jewish life, on the diversity of Jewish life in Europe today uh, to ensure, for example, also in Europe, we have a, a Jewish heritage month that is September, but nobody knows about it. It's a similar situation where uh, synagogues are open, you have open days and, uh, and there are festivals and so on, but it's, it's not very known. So for example, Germany will this year, uh, 2021, um, start uh, one year of uh, 1,700 years of Jewish life in uh, Germany. So this is, this is you know, an enormous amount of time. Um, and there will be thousands of events all over Germany to make it, uh, to make it visible. We have another um, organization which is called Likrat, where um, two Jewish students ideally um, go into school classes to uh, talk about their individual way of how they live Judaism. Usually it's, it's a, a boy and a girl and a secular and a religious to show this uh, diversity. So I think, especially in Europe, it has to do also, you know, the, the skepticism sometimes has to do also with the fact that people simply because of the Holocaust don't 
no any Jews because the communities are very small. And it is also for that reason that um, we as European Union, as uh, member states have the responsibility to foster Jewish life. And actually when um, President von der Leyen came into office, she added to, to my title, combating antisemitism, this aspect of fostering uh, Jewish life. So it is, it's very important, I believe, to, to train the trainers, to train the teachers, to be able to convey that as well, but simply also in the public sphere, through media, through um, uh, social media, you know, we can use it for a positive uh, fact and spread uh, knowledge also about uh, the Jewish community. Let me follow up on that in terms of the, the expansion of, of your responsibilities to safeguarding Jewish life. Uh, freedom to practice uh, Jewish religious and ritual life is essential uh, to that. And we've been troubled by discussions um, in Sweden around banning Brit Milah earlier in the year, uh, which thankfully were, were swiftly put to rest. But in the last couple of weeks, uh, we've had situations in, in Finland uh, and uh, in Denmark. Um, <clears throat> there already are a full or partial bans on, on kosher slaughter in Scandinavia, in Switzerland and Belgium. Recent opinion by the AG of the European Court of Justice that the Schrita ban in Flanders goes against EU law is an encouraging sign, but uh, the constant reemergence of these discussions is truly worrying. What is, what is your team doing uh, on this front? Now on both debates, uh, I believe uh, that we have to acknowledge that already the debate in itself is harmful because it portrays Jews as backwards, as child molesting, as not caring for animal rights. And, uh, and I believe what is important here, this, you know, th this is a, a question of in particular working with uh, parliamentarians because in the end it is there where the, um, where the room, the space is used to have these kind of debates, to, to propose motions, to pass motions or to, um, to um, nip these discussions in the bud and say, we are not going further, this, this is, essential to our Jewish uh, life. So with regards to kosher meat, you already mentioned that um, there is a certain EU competence. We have legislation whereby um, the, the member states can decide uh, for religious reasons to allow uh, slaughtering without stunning. And we believe that within the freedom of religion, it is necessary to grant this exemption. <coughs> When it comes, um, and I believe that this will be also in, increasingly the, the situation that once member states have granted is like was the case in Belgium, you cannot just simply uh, take it away. On the other um, uh, issue on, uh, on circumcision, it is more complicated because it is very much a responsibility and a, a competence of, uh, of the member states. So each time when we had in member states and discussions starting on, on a circumcision, we have had political interventions from our side to, uh, to say, you know, it is not only necessary to grant um, Jews and also Muslims the right to exercise their religion, they must also be able to carry it out, to live it. And for that, you need uh, the possibility to circumcise and, um, and prohibiting it basically just extinguishes Jewish life in that particular country. So for now, and we, th we think that in, in the end, it will not come to pass that any member state will prohibit it. But as I said, already the debate is harmful and therefore on political level, we, um, we interfere and I have frequent discussions with different officials um, in different member states uh, on this. But of course, usually these kind of um, uh, motions or suggestions come uh, from the either far left, uh, which is often the case, which is also more difficult than to uh, to address, or um, the far right, where it is uh, where it is clearer and it's uh, it's a racist issue that, as also Ellie said already, is less uh, accepted in general. Yeah, so it's a political uh, issue, but. Um, 
we want to ensure that um, that this is possible and therefore our interaction must be political as we don't have a competence to legislate, let's say. Thank you. Um, Ellie, just I want to go back to the uh, security of <coughs> communities question, um, particularly in Latin America. Um, the, the ties of uh, the Venezuelans to, uh, to Iran um, and, and other uh, kind of activity in Latin America um, surrounding terrorist organizations or those who support terrorist organizations is, is of great concern. Um, how do you think this is having an impact on Jewish communities? You know, we just had the 26th anniversary back in July of the, the bombing of the AMIA building in, in Buenos Aires. Um, what, what kinds of things are you seeing in that part of the world? Uh, Dan, I'm, I'm so glad we're talking about Latin America because um, as you know, as B'nai B'rith <clears throat> works so hard on these issues, there are um, Jewish populations uh, throughout that region. And um, I would tell you, Dan, that um, first of all, I think, I think you were referring to Hezbollah's presence, right, in uh, Latin America, in the tri-border region area, which is, you know, the, the borders between Argentina, Brazil, um, Paraguay, Uruguay. So, um, and so look, this is something that, that the US government is very well aware of, the presence of Hezbollah in Latin America, right on our doorstep. And one of the issues that our office advocates very strongly for, and, uh, and, and many other offices in the State Department is the designation of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization in its entirety. Um, I think it's something that our administration has been tremendously successful with. Um, we're seeing more and more countries designate Hezbollah every week. In fact, um, just recently it was Guatemala, Estonia, and the Czech Republic who have done so. Um, and so, you know, it's incredibly important because, um, Dan, the AMIA attack uh, that was conducted by Hezbollah in Argentina 26 years ago is the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in the Americas since World War II. So, um, Jews need to understand the kind of threat that Hezbollah does, uh, does um, ha hold for Jews, but also for all populations. Um, because, you know, I think that one of the things when you study anti Semitism, you understand that Jews are often the canary in the coal mine, so that the hatred that starts with Jews never ends with Jews and it destructs the society around Jews wherever, wherever anti Semitism is allowed to take hold. And so Hezbollah is definitely one of the primary issues issues when it comes to Latin America. Um, to, your, to your point, Dan, regarding Venezuela and Iran, yes, um, those are two outlaw regimes that we are sadly seeing um, tied very closely to each other. In fact, I would say that Iran's presence and influence on Venezuela has a huge part of, uh, of, of, of what happened in the downfall of Venezuela. Um, you know, going from a, an, an oil rich, um, wealthy uh, society and country to now a country that is, you know, living in devastation and in complete poverty. Um, so, you know, you can see that the Iranian influence um, correlates with, with all that has gone wrong in Venezuela, uh, sadly, for the people of Venezuela. And um, I know that B'nai B'rith is tracking that in terms of the Jewish community. Um, most have fled, right? Most Jews of Venezuela have fled. Many have found themselves coming to Miami in the United States and elsewhere in Latin America. Um, and the safety and security of the Jewish community in Venezuela is one that the United States is tracking very closely. We have our eye very closely on Venezuela and how they are treating the Jews there. I would tell you the same goes for the Jews in Iran. Uh, they, they are a group that our office is tracking very closely, as is the entire administration, and we always have our eyes on the safety and security of those Jewish populations that we believe as a whole could be under threat by their governments. Well, thank you. Thank you to you both. <clears throat> We're going to move now uh, to Q&A. We um, uh, don't have a lot of time, perhaps for one or two questions, so joining us now is my colleague, Eric Fussfield, who serves as Deputy Director of our Center for Human Rights and Public Policy. Eric has been monitoring the questions 
that have come in on the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, Eric, what are you seeing people ask? Yes, uh, Katarina and Ellie, good to see both of you. Uh, thank you for being with us today. We've gotten, um, I, I'm gonna consolidate a little bit here in the interest of time. We've gotten a few good questions about educational reform and I, we've already started a discussion about how education can be proactive. Um, pro education about Jews and Jewish heritage in th these different regions rather than just uh, reactive. Um, but uh, so I, I wanna ask about this um, in, it, with respect to the regions that you cover, Ellie, you referenced the agreement with uh, Bahrain on um, combating anti-Semitism, uh, but, uh, and it incorporated the IRA definition, which is important, but the focus there was on um, educational programs. There was no enforcement mechanism, of course. So like with respect to, for example, school textbooks, which are very much in need of reform and throughout the Middle East. Um, uh, do, do, does the normalization of ties between Israel and some Arab countries open a window to clamp down on this kind of anti-Israel incitement and anti-Semitic hatred? And Katarina, um, for you, I guess the question is the difficulties where there's a longer history of um, educating for tolerance and educating about the Holocaust, certainly in Europe, but that experience has not gone without its challenges in Europe because there are, particularly among immigrant communities, let's say a certain amount of resistance to learning about the Holocaust and teachers are sort of caught in between and don't exactly know how to react and to deal with this uh, circumstance. So if you could both uh, speak to those dimensions. Hi, Eric. Um, <clears throat> happy to do so. So I would say, Eric, that uh, the Abraham Accords, the uh, warm peace between Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, and the State of Israel, Sudan announced most recently, um, these, um, these peace deals are without a doubt a game changer in the region. Um, and we are confident that we're gonna see a lowering of anti-Semitism in the region as a result of these peace deals. Um, and any of us who are monitoring what's happening just purely on social media, you know, I cannot get over the warm embrace I'm seeing between people in the United Arab Emirates, people in Bahrain towards Jews and Israelis. There's already been so many visits back and forth and uh, initiatives that have started. So, um, so I really believe that the Abraham Accords have, have, have tremendously changed the Middle East, North Africa region in a way that um, generations of our children and grandchildren are going to benefit from it. Um, Eric, regarding textbooks specifically, um, in fact, it is true that for a very long time, we have been seeing the most vile kind of anti-Semitism coming out of textbooks in the Middle East. Um, uh, and so, you know, we're very aware of which countries those are. It's, I would tell you, it's not as, you know, Bahrain has had a Jewish community since 1880 and they've been living there peacefully and happily. They're, you know, the first uh, Jewish woman ambassador of the Arab world came out of Bahrain, Ambassador Huda Nunu, years ago. So uh, certainly it's not, that's not an issue that we're seeing in countries like Bahrain and the UAE. I would tell you we're seeing it more in places like the Palestinian Authority, like Iran. Um, and to, you know, to some extent in, in other countries in the region. And that is something that we've been advocating very strongly for in the State Department for countries to um, work with us on revising those textbooks. And, and I would tell you again that I am very optimistic that in the Gulf Arab states, we're going to continue to see um, normalization towards the state of Israel, a warm embrace towards Jewish people, and we're going to see a lessening of anti-Semitic, you know, content in textbooks and in their media, and uh, and so that is something that we've started to witness, and I'm confident will continue to go on. Um, regarding um, your, I think your, I just want to also make one point regarding Holocaust education, which I didn't get to address earlier. Um, I think everyone, I hope, knows that we passed the bipartisan never again uh, Holocaust Education Act in the United States. And, you know, similar time period, we also saw uh, very disturbing 
um, surveys come out where, Amer where Americans, and uh, never mind American Jews, but Americans broadly have um, very pitiful levels of understanding about what happened in the Holocaust. So I just did want to mention that, that the Never Again Education Act signed by President Trump is I think a huge step forward. It allocates $2 million additional dollars a year to the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. And this is also somewhere where local Jew, uh, communities can get involved because it's really incumbent on local schools to, um, to take these resources and teach it to their kids. And so all of the parents who might be on today, please know that this is something that's available to your local community. You just kind of have to grab it and take it. Okay, thanks, Ellie. Um, Katarina. Yes, thank you. Um, Eric, it's great to see you again. Um, now, on, uh, on European uh, level, again, we have, uh, we have a twofold system. One is that, for example, when it comes to curricula and to the education of teachers, it is the, the responsibility of uh, each member state separately in the context of their, uh, their national uh, structures. However, um, we on European level have started to uh, gather member states uh, educational uh, officials together again with the Jewish community uh, to give an opportunity to discuss how to revise curricula, um, how to ensure that um, the teachers uh, know about uh, uh, about the Holocaust, about, are capable of teaching it also in difficult environments uh, where they can be challenged um, by students, um, but also that they recognize uh, anti-Semitism in school courtyards. So even the sports teacher needs to be able to intervene uh, when uh, when he hears uh, anti-Semitic uh, slurs, and the and the principals of schools need to know how to react um, when. Uh, a Jewish uh, child is being uh, harassed um, and not try to solve the Middle East conflict, but rather be clear about the fact that there is a victim and there is a, a perpetrator. So that is something that we have uh, and are continuing to discuss uh, with member states. There are also different, um, there's material um, from the Fundamental Rights Agency, but also um, from UNESCO that, uh, that can be uh, very helpful. We have on the second level, funding um, uh, for educational uh, uh, tools and um, yeah, to, to talk about not only the Holocaust, but also anti-Semitism, which is called Europe for Citizens, where, uh, where civil society organizations um, can uh, apply for funds uh, to uh, reach out to specific groups or to uh, in specific environments um, and or to look into specific history in their local environment. Uh, uh, and uh, that has become an increasingly important tool and we have uh, just received a lot more uh, funding for this program. So we will be able to, um, to really upscale our uh, support for local uh, and uh, and regional initiatives uh, there. And then there is another aspect that you alluded to uh, is really the question of integration and how uh, we can reach um, uh, to uh, young people, but also adults with a migration background. And that is also part of that uh, de declaration that I've mentioned a couple of times. Um, where member states have committed to integrating knowledge about anti-Semitism, about the Holocaust, about Jewish life uh, into general integration measures. And now in December, we will have again a meeting with the responsible authorities in member states and the Jewish uh, communities. We will have exp experts there who will explain how this uh, can be done. We will have certain member states who have started doing something uh, to explain what they are doing so others can uh, take the those as examples. And of course, again, um, no, knowledge about the IVA definition is very important and an important starting point for all these uh, activities um, uh, among, uh, among teachers and among educators more generally. And I think it's, it's very important um, that we, um, uh, you know, we, I think there is a lot of in, important measures happening on European level, also on national level, but what is necessary is really that we have a paradigm change in 
the general public about the awareness uh, of, of Jewish life and Jewish contribution. And therefore, uh, we need to go into all uh, existing structures, societal ones and educational ones, uh, to reach that. And that's what we are doing now, and that will, is what's going to happen um, increasingly now in this mandate of uh, President von der Leyen. Thank you, Katharina. Eric, I think we have time for one more very short question. One short more, answers. Yeah, what, what, one more question. And uh, I, I think this one is representative of the kind of uh, global grassroots president presence that B'nai B'rith has and shows the kind of things that we're observing um, from country to country. Uh, Professor, Professor Asher Matathias in Greece, he's a, a president of a B'nai B'rith Lodge in Greece. Um, is said that uh, there is, um, uh, Dr. Albertos Borlas is uh, a doctor in Greece who's, um, his firm is developing a COVID vaccination, COVID vaccine, and um, an Athens newspaper ran on its front page. When I say front page in the online sense, it was a link near the top of their website of an, to an editorial cartoon featuring uh, Dr. Borlas and um, Joseph Mengele, the, the Nazi uh, doctor, um, it, it, like in a way that suggested um, he wanted to inject people with a um, COVID vaccination that is uh, really poison. And this kind of despicable overt uh, anti-Semitism, unfortunately, is with us. It, it raises the questions about free speech and free media that we, we spoke about earlier. But I'm wondering, um, what are the strategies for dealing with this kind of um, anti-Semitism in the media, in, in Europe, as it applies to a free press, and, and in the Middle East, where it applies to a, 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 a media that's usually not free? So for the free press, if I can uh, address that, I believe, uh, first of all, there are regulati uh, regulatory uh, bodies that need to act in such cases. And in fact, uh, we have reminded also Greece of the uh, obligation um, to do so. And we discussed uh, already earlier, more generally, what needs to happen with regards to social platforms, where we can also see this kind of uh, vile uh, anti-Semitism. So it's, uh, I believe it's very important to really use um, uh, the uh, all available instruments for that, especially since we have legislation uh, that uh, uh, whenever inciting to hatred and violence is hate speech that uh, is unacceptable. But then there is a second aspect to that, and that is that you have people who place this kind of uh, speech. And it is important for the state authorities to uh, prosecute such, uh, such speech because what is online, what is illegal in the real world is also illegal online. And sometimes we seem to think that it is a virtual world and a real world, but in fact, uh, the law applies throughout. And it is very important that this kind of um, instigations and uh, statements are uh, also prosecuted. Thank you. Ellie, a word on that before we close? Sure. You know what? I would tell you, Dan and Eric, that um, to me, this incident is, um, is indicative of incidents like this all over the world that we're seeing all the time. And so I would say as, as kind of a concluding thought, anti-Semitism is not a Jewish problem. Anti-Semitism is a problem for global societies to, to manage and wrestle with and really fight back against. Because as I mentioned earlier, um, every society where anti-Semitism has been allowed to take root winds up suffering as a result of it. And you only need to look at the Holocaust in Europe. You only need to look at the Spanish Inquisition in Spain to see how that has played out in history. So um, whether it's Greece or it's Chile uh, or Germany, wherever these incidents take place, um, we really call upon all citizens, all people of, of good faith to, uh, to partner with, with, with all the other good actors out there to find each other and to fight this global scourge. Well, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, and thanks to both of our guests. I, I want both of you to know, uh, really, we don't take the work that either of you do for granted. 
Uh, we've worked uh, very closely with the Special Envoy's Office. It's been a great relationship. It has really reached out to our community and, and beyond, more importantly, beyond. Uh, and we deeply appreciate that. And Katarina, really, for such a long time, uh, I know how much the uh, not only the European Jewish community, uh, but we, all of us uh, really look to you uh, for the important work uh, that you do every day. So uh, to our guests, Katarina von Schnurbein of the European Commission and Eli Kohanim of the United States State Department, thanks very much to you both for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. An absolute pleasure.